Madam First Lady, so lovely to see you. And thank you for being with us. Thanks, Zain. It's such a pleasure to be here. You know, the word resilience is resonating big today across the globe. How does that word hit for you as an African leader who's seen the continent through a myriad of crises? And how does it resonate going forward? I think for me as an African, resilience is all we've ever known. Um, and the personification of resilience to me is the poor rural African woman. So globally, everybody has to be resilient, but in an unequal world, some need to be more resilient than others. And I think um, Africans define um, resilience. And how have you observed over, say, the last year or two um, in Namibia and in the rest of the continent that that resilience has, ha, ha, has been handled? How has it been managed by leaders and, and, and successfully navigated the continent through these crises? So the continent being as complex as it is, it, it's meant different things for different places in the continent. But certainly for Namibia, what we've seen was a historical divide between the private and the public sector um, narrow somewhat, where you saw the private sector stepping in a little bit more to collaborate and work with government um, in resolving a lot of the crises, the multiple crises that were occasioned by COVID. So, so to me, that enhanced resilience, where you start seeing different sectors of society starting to work together quite well. Optimistic, neutral, or pessimistic? How is it looking for Africa from your point of view in 2022 and, and, and say six to 12 months ahead? So I've always defined myself as an optimist and I always get irritated with the idea of pessimism. Uh, but I think the last two years has brought out pessimistic thoughts in all of us. Um, so I think for me, it's optimism with a much more grounded understanding of concerns that we need to address quite urgently. Like? So obviously inflation, um, food security, a um, youth population that's getting restless. We need to start paying attention to the mild coup fever that we've picked up that's resulting in right. democratic reversals. Right. Um, and also really looking at our political systems, whether our political systems are reacting to the moment that we find ourselves in. What do you think can be done better or differently to build back? A couple of things. A couple of things. Uh, but let me, let me start on how do you build back and, and who is in charge of building back. So how we do it better, and, and um, it's really about thinking about government, because government is there to solve our most complex problems, and many governments have a talent problem, and we need, to, we need to plug this talent problem in government so that we have our best brains solving our most complex problems. Um, political systems have proven themselves not to be great um, at giving it a, us our best, but our civil service, our technocrats, should represent our best. And I think that's part of where we can get a good foundation of building back better. And, and we hear frequently how money and, and funding is being held back by investors recently who were very enthusiastic about Africa only you know, six to 12 months ago. Uh, that, that was the story. Um, what, what is your view on that? I mean, is that a smart strategy to kind of pull back, wait and see? Is, 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 you know, since you're an optimistic, you're going to, optimist, you're going to say no. <laughs> but what, what are your thoughts on what we actually see happening on the continent in that regard? So, so what I'm seeing on the continent is you've got policymakers who are a little bit more humble isn't the right word, but a little bit more realistic about the type of policies that will facilitate investment. You've got valuations that are more realistic. You've got a need for external um, capital. So now is the right time to, to pile in when you're actually wanted and where you can sit around in a room and craft how you're going to build back better. So, so now is the right time. And, and what sectors do you think uh, would you prioritize, say, for example, in Namibia or in the region? So certainly services, um, logistics, um, sustainable tourism, um, clean energy. So those to me are, are, are very clear sectors um, where there's massive opportunities on the continent and in Namibia.
What are some of the challenges uh, that, you know, that, that we see in the global south, for instance? You know, there's, there's a dichotomy you know, between you know, choices that you have to make on the one hand for, uh, that, that are production-oriented, that, um, you know, that serve populations, but then also have a damaging impact on, on climate, uh, for example. So there's this balance that has to be handled in countries, for example, like ours. I'm from Kenya. Uh, so, so there is that dichotomy faced with people that, that live on the continent. So how, how would you address that going forward? So the dichotomy is, is, is multiple. Um, you've got the dichotomy, for instance, of um, many countries, including Namibia, being post-conflict societies. Right where, to an extent, we haven't prioritized things like mental health, which we regard as soft issues, but which cause significant um, socioeconomic problems, which we need to address um, in a more focused manner. But then the dichotomy that you speak about in relation to climate change, again, Namibia is a great example, right. because we've got uh, fresh oil discoveries, but at the same time, we're pushing uh, green hydrogen quite aggressively. And that, to me, really... Um, clarifies the dichotomy you speak of because um, it is a transition and there will be an element of fossil fuels that remains required um, as we transition into cleaner energy and, and Namibia really um, is at the forefront of that. And you have a, a very strong background in, in finance, private equity, uh, and, and, and I, I'd like to ask you, how does Africa restructure debt and its finance issues today that are quite significant and are posing multiple challenges across the border for many African nations? Uh, could you talk to us a little bit about that and what you think uh, the priorities are or should be? So the rising debt burden of many african countries um, again it's different you you've got countries like namibia um, where we've seen a ballooning of debt but it still remains manageable um, but we're very concerned for instance about our debt servicing costs so obviously something needs to happen there how to restructure debt zane i think is um, there's only a few ways that you can restructure debt but the essence of this restructuring is negotiating. So, so firstly and obviously, we may need to look at negotiating better debt agreements, um, but even to restructure repayment terms to um, reduce this um, rising um, cost of servicing debt, whether it's um, improved um, public financial management, whether it's stopping illicit flows. Right. What is at the core of that? It's people. So we need to strengthen our negotiating teams who go and negotiate restructuring of debt, who go and negotiating debt agreements in the first place. Um, and really what I was saying in the beginning of strengthening our, our, uh, the technocratic capability um, in many of our governments, mm. because a lot of our foundational problems comes from problematically negotiated right. agreements. So, so in, in a way to me, it's not about the restructuring of debt, it's about the talent at the table that speaks to the restructuring and negotiates deals on behalf of government. You said problematic negotiation a couple of times now. <laughs> so what, 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 are, what are some of the core issues or missteps then that occur in your view in that moment? So I'm married to a president, Zain, and I want to remain married after this session. So I'm not going to, <laughs> I'm not going to, to Who's say here? that. But, but I, I, I certainly do believe that um, <laughs> there are debt agreements, and I'm, I'm not talking about uh, Namibia, my husband, um, that could have been better negotiated. Um, some, and, and, some, and I think that may be the solution for some of these debts, because debts that were political in nature, uh, with no commercial underpin, um, are very difficult to manage. So I think there must be political solutions to that. And I think maybe also speaking as a continent in one voice on very specific um, debt crises that certain African countries face. Like, we must all agree that uh, sanctions on Zimbabwe must be lifted. We must all agree that something drastic has to happen in Zambia around their, their debt structure, the same with Mozambique. Because some countries' situations are different to others, but we all agree with the principle that there must be a willingness to help some of these countries renegotiate and restructure their debt. When investors think of Africa, there's the perception and then there's the reality, yes. right? How, how, how would you explain that to us today? How, how, how uh, do you think that we should understand the reality of doing business in Africa on the ground today? 
So the, the perception has always lagged behind the reality. And I think we as Africans have a, an obligation um, to drive a new narrative, um, be realistic about the challenges we face, because to me, the, the opportunities are bigger than the challenges, and the challenges are real. So, so we have an obligation to, to um, reshape that narrative um, and make it clear that um, what happens in one part of the continent does not impact a different part of the continent. And that when you see many talented Africans on stages like this, they are not an exception. It is a con continent full of talent. Um, and to exceptionalize what you perceive to be talented and kind of make a basket case of everybody else um, is not correct. And then what's important for me is we must, we must find a way to, to humanize ourselves as Africans because often, and we see it, we see, for instance, we've got a lot of people who work in, in different countries, um, domestic workers who, who come to different areas of the world to seek employment. And they're not always treated in a humane way because I think there's a, there's a dehumanization of Africans that we need to resolve and ensure that our people are treated well outside but we also rehumanize ourselves on our own continent and treat our own people at home um, so that we, we stop seeing the manifestations of what happens to a people who've been historically dehumanized and where others feel comfortable treating you as if you don't exist or you're not a person. And one final thought for our audience here in the room and also watching online. If there was one thing that you would like to share about the continent today that, that we've not talked about, what would it be? What would it be? We've talked about young people um, and their immense potential, but we haven't talked enough about the political capability and how we're transitioning, how we're managing succession, and how we're looking forward to a younger crop of leaders who think about things differently and who can manage 21st century problems um, with 21st century mindsets. I don't think we got you in trouble uh, <laughs> with your husband here. <laughs> Did we, Excellency? <laughs> We're good. All right. <laughs> Monica Geingos, uh, thank you so much. Uh, First Lady of Namibia, really appreciate your insight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.